time and space. Everywhere and anywhere, every star that ever was. Where do you want to start? It's time to head back into space for Season 3 of Doctor Who. And unusually for classic-era fans of Doctor Who, there are ladies here. <laughs> I'm Ian. And I'm Mark, and welcome to All of Time and Space. And this time round, we're going to be looking at Galaxy 4. So let's get up to speed with where we are in the story. Following a skirmish in deep space, two alien spacecraft have crash-landed on a barren planet in Galaxy 4. The Dravins are a race of beautiful females led by the imperious Marga. The Rills are hideous tusked monstrosities, accompanied by their robotic servants, the Chumblies. When the Doctor arrives, he discovers that the planet will explode in two days time. The Dravins desperately ask for his help in escaping the planet and the belligerent Rills. But things are not always as they seem, as we are about to find out. And welcome back. And it's the start of a brand new season, season three. And we've got an extra special guest for our first episode. We have the lovely Andrea from Trek This Out. Hello, Andrea. Hello. Thank you for having me on the show. Oh, well, I've been wanting to have you on for a while and thought, well, this would be the perfect opportunity. That was nice and carefully phrased. 
<laughs> that could have sounded super wrong. <laughs> See, I've already been on five minutes and I'm luring the tone already. Well, no, nah, that's all right. You know, we're used to that. We, you know, we do like to uh, come out with single entendres ourselves. We are going to change things up for this season. We're keeping the Mind Pro, but it's a slightly different format this year round. So, um, Ian, why don't you get things started? Well, I will. Um, but firstly, Mark, I think we should level with the listeners. The reason we're having to change the Mind Pro for the start of season three is that you broke the time lash. Um, well, yeah, sorry, I got I got a bit carried away. You you left it plugged in and it overheated yeah. and it's melted through halfway through into the, yeah. the ground, right? Yeah, it's, it's not good. It's not good. The tinsel's ruined. Right, well, you're going to yeah. need to replace that tinsel and um, if we okay. can have an update on on how you get along trying to fix it uh, and then we can get yeah, back to business as best. usual. Well, you know, fingers crossed, eh? Well, exactly. Now then, Andrea, can you hear me? I can. Andrea, it is time for you to face the mind probe. No, not the mind probe. Getting to know who? Getting to know all about who? That's Geordie, Doctor Who. That's brilliant. Wonderful. I have a number of questions here, which uh, are not quiz based any longer. They're more they're more informal. It's more of a chat. We just want to give the the listeners more of a, a feel as to who you are and and um, uh, and that sort of thing. So I'll kick off. Um, how long have you been a fan of Doctor Who? Um. I'm gonna. I'm a bit vague um, as to when. Um, my earliest memory of Doctor Who is uh, Terror of the Vervoids, um, which I, I, I do cite as have having some quite serious impact on my sexuality. I can imagine. Um, oh, but dear, that, yeah. is, that is my earliest memory of Doctor Who. So I, I think it's probably been in my life for about 30 I want to say 34 years, um, but I also don't want to say how old I am. So um, I understand completely. <laughs> and let's draw a veil over that. I'm, I'm... <clears throat> yes. <laughs> let's go with. That. Yeah, I'm just trying. I don't think my sexuality was really rattled by terror of the vervoids. It was mainly, predictably, kind of formulated halfway through part one of planet of fire um mm -hmm. what what are your other passions in life? Speedos. <laughs> andrea sorry what are your other passions in life pretty much anyone who's sort of come across me on social media will know that i am um, I, I myself described jason isaac's enthusiast and that poor unfortunate man is stuck with me and quite a motley band of my mates who represent a particularly irreverent fan club who he's very much aware of so so that kind of takes up a little bit of my time in terms of fandom obviously i'm on trek this out uh, i pretty much describe myself as an accidental trekkie that just kind of happened um i'm not quite sure how but and in sort of wider life i sort of work in a special school i'm sort of assistant head of a special school with kids with challenging behaviour and um, social and emotional issues, mental health issues. So that kind of eats up a lot of my life, far more than I would like. Um, I'm a little bit of a, a half-hearted gamer and a, a struggling amateur artist. Um, so I would say they're my main. Oh, I think, you, I think you are really doing yourself down there, Andrea. I have seen some of your artwork and it is amazing. Um, I'm just a hobbyist and I, I think I, I kind of see a little bit of improvement, but I'm probably my own harshest critic, so... Well, you're telling me. <laughs> You've done some great stuff. <laughs> Where can people check out your artwork if they want to really get a taste of what you can do? Um, if I'm in Vin of the Basement, the Basement is the uh, aforementioned Jason Isaacs fan club. You find me on Instagram under that. Um, you find me on Twitter um, at Vintage1983. Um, I post quite a lot of stuff on there as well. And at the moment, there's a project going on called Women of Trek, Women Make Trek. Um, oh. So there's a Women Make Trek website um, and some of my artworks on there as well and there's some other really really good artists so it's definitely oh, worth awesome. checking out fantastic okay um so we know kind of where you're coming from with doctor who what would you say was your favorite era 
of the show. Oh, I'm a fickle creature. Um, I, I'm a sort of. I think I like pears, so I like I like three and Joe. I like anything with Sarah Jane in it. I like mm. Ace with Seven. I like Twelve with Clara. Uh, I think I, I think the pears or, or the, the the Tardis group has to be right for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I can't choose my favourite Doctor. Please don't ask me to do that because that changes from week to week and depending yeah. on my mood. That's hard. <laughs> that seems <laughs> entirely reasonable. Would you be able to pick out a favourite classic and a favourite new new story? <sighs> do you know what? I, I, I want to say Genesis of the Daleks, but everyone says Genesis of the Daleks. So I'm gonna pick. I'm gonna pick Battlefield. Oh wow! <laughs> and. That's a deep cut. For more recent, I'm going to pick Mummy on the Orient Express. Nice. Fantastic pair of stories. Uh, Let's just ask you one more. What would you say was your favourite movie? Oh, I'm not good at this. I'm not good at... I'm terrible at lists. I'm terrible at, like, choosing... (laughs) I kind of feel, feel like there's a lot of people who will be listening to this who are going to be very disappointed if I pick something that doesn't have Jason Isaacs in it. But <laughs> he's self-confessed that he's been in lots of shit. And yes, I have had that conversation. <sighs> That's really hard. Empire Strikes Back. That's a pretty good choice, go I've got to that, say. Can you? Uh, Andrea, thank you for submitting yourself to the Mind Probe. You're good to go. But I, I've got to be honest, that, that felt like quite a, like, I, I don't know, it, like your favourite film and your favourite Doctor and things, they're like, like, like daddy or chips, aren't they? I can't really choose. I'm, I'm not a I'm not decisive person, clearly. Um, I've, I've learned something from, from being probed already. Well, well, you know, if you were just giving, <laughs> you know, easy, pat, one word, answers without even thinking about it, it would make for quite boring listening. So... Um, I think I think your style has worked uh, really rather well. I'm interested. Yeah. Indecisive is the future. Maybe. Well, you're in good company. Excellent. Well, I suppose we ought to really get around to talking about Galaxy 4. We can't really put it off much longer. I'll come out with the usual question that I tend to come out with when we do these things. What was our first experience of watching or experiencing this story? And I'll come to Ian first. Well, uh, my first experience was watching it yesterday. Um, <laughs> nice. I'm so uh, for well, Andrew. Quite fresh in your memory, then. Yeah, for Andrew's benefit, and for anyone listening for the first time, I'm kind of an '80s guy. Um, I started watching with kind of the fag end of Tom Baker, Peter Davison, um, and became a, you know a huge Doctor Who spod. Um, but I've never really gone back and sort of watched the 60s stories so apart from a few exceptions this you know this first 20 years of our podcast where we review the the 60s (laughs) stories is all new to me and I'm generally watching them uh you know just in time for each recording so I watched it yesterday and I'm I'm primed I'm I'm full of I've got literally a page of notes and a drawing of a I think that's a chicken nice yeah and Andrea, what about yourself? Um, well, well, I marathoned all Doctor Who that was available, but pre-2011, in fact, pre-2005, which was okay. a bit of a big borrow and steal to get hold of things on VHS. Mm. And I think oh. there's, there's sort of, there's, there's the remaining episode and there's a small clip. And I think that mm. clip was on a VHS. I yeah. can't remember which one. But I had seen that, um, and I'm going to hold yeah. my hands up and say I hadn't really revisited. I, I think when it came out, when it was found, I think I kind of watched the episode. Yeah. But uh, that, me properly watching it, uh, uh, that's kind of the first time I've really kind of sat down and and, and watched the reconstruction-y bits and stuff like that. So a so bad fan, I think, for me as well. Ah, <laughs> uh, There's no such thing as a bad fan. Um, my own personal experience on this one... I went through a phase, ooh, it was certainly prior to the 50th, where I just got really obsessed with the missing episodes in a really big way. I was probably fired up by the Omni rumour and all that stuff that was going on about potentially everything coming back, which turned out to be not quite the case, but even so, we did get some really decent stuff back, as it turned out. Um, so, yeah, a friend had 
given me a disc with a load of mp3s of the soundtracks uh, for all of the missing stuff so i was making my way through those and i think i remember quite enjoying it and i think i was aware of its reputation and it's prior to getting ready to record it was always one i felt had a bit of a a lackluster reputation although as i think without trying to spoil it too much we may find out when we come to our feedback section uh, it seems to have been quite popular with at least the people who tend to listen to our show so ian first impressions well the very first exhibit i'd like to bring before the court is the title of this story is galaxy form mm. which is yeah. no more than a reference to where some of the characters have come from <laughs> I would like to put forward the motion that this is a crap title for a story. <laughs> I think it's a mysterious title. I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, but there's, it doesn't deliver on that, does it? It's got no oh. the. It feels wrong because it's got no... If yeah. it was the Galaxy 4, it would sound like it fits the... It's because there's no the. And 60s even Doctor Who has four. to have a the. Mm. Yeah, Doctor Who and the Galaxy 4. That's, that's, how, that's how Doctor Who is, surely. <laughs> um, being a good little writer, I've I've put my thinking cap on and tried to come up with some better titles. Oh, what do yeah. we think of the real thing? <laughs> oh, nice, mm. yeah. Or how about this one? You're driving me crazy. Oh, see, that's that's one of my thoughts for the title for this episode. Well, let's do it. That's that's locked. That's definite. We're in simpatico. Hey, wow. Um, <laughs> beyond that, I thought the story was interesting in some ways. I thought it was poor in some ways. I thought it was good in other ways. Um, I think Peter Purvis makes a big deal about having to inherit the stuff that was written for Barbara uh, when he takes on the role of Stephen. And um, I noticed they've, they've given him one of Barbara's old uh, cardigans as well, which is a nice touch. I noticed that too, and there's a moment, there's the moment in episode three where he sort of gets up and he's mooching, he's kind of hunched over in that cardigan, and he's got his hair's gone a bit boof, and he really looked like Edwina Curry. I've got to be honest, I have nice. written down Stephen's hair deserves its own credit. It probably has its own <laughs> gravity and could hold the planet together. Why are they worried? Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm rooting for Stephen's <laughs> hair. Um, now, it was the most exciting thing about him in the episode. Really, he wasn't given a great deal mm -hmm. to do. No, you know, the Doctor and particularly Vicky get a slightly better deal. Uh, but yeah, Stephen's yeah. a bit like you just put Stephen in a corner with his cardigan and his hair. <laughs> now, what's particularly interesting about that is the story begins with Vicky giving Stephen a haircut. So we can only conclude that moments before episode one started, he had even more hair than he, he must managed have had to the have. Mother of all afros. Well, exactly. He must have looked absolutely ludicrous. It did make me think, though, that you you don't often see uh, companions kind of grooming themselves in the TARDIS. You didn't see sort of Tegan's '80s hair salon where they sort of. <laughs> laughingly refused to give Adric a, a short back and sides. Um, well, they had the pudding base in reserve for that, didn't they? So I guess. And even in the new series, actually, you'd think there'd be some, you know, bits of, I don't know, maybe maybe Rose doing her lippy in a mirror, or um, you know, uh, Rory checking out his uh, stunning physique. I don't know. Um, so it's interesting that you get that kind of really nice domestic touch right at the hmm. top of this story to kind of reintroduce these characters to the audience. And, yeah. you know, this is the TARDIS crew. Here they are. See how they get along. Um, see how Stephen has stolen one of Barbara's cardigans. Um, and I thought that was a, a really <laughs> lovely introduction. Now, this story introduces the Dravins. Now, for anyone who's... Not such a fan of this story. I want to make this argument. This was way ahead of its time. Not just their funky outfits, which, I mean, I'm sure you guys might have something to say about that, but their leader is called Marga, or Maga. I've got a hat with her on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, she's got these underlings who are, um, they're not proper Dravins, they're kind of clones or whatever. And just a few observations I made. So Marga's followers are, um, they love guns, 
and they're not especially bright. They believe their leader's lies without question. And um, they are a bit racist as well when it comes to the old rills. Wow, Mark, are you are you going yeah. somewhere with this? Are you making some sort of no, real no, just world some casual comparison? observations that I made. Well, that's which really have no relevance to the modern no, world whatsoever. I, I can't think of any large group of people or demographic for whom <laughs> those facts all hold true. No, you're right. It is um, in that sense. It is very much ahead of its time. <laughs> um, Andrea, what did you make of the Dravins? I, I have. I've written down that um, if I've got a black marker pen to hand, I, I could do Marga's makeup, <laughs> and it would be the cheapest cosplay <laughs> ever. Um, <laughs> I did consider doing it for the podcast, but I'm just going to be brutal and say I can't be asked. I'm fair play to you for going the whole hog with the old uh, the beehive hairdo for tonight. That was really uh, quite. You just pushed it the extra mile. Yeah, no worries. I, I don't think my fringe is in good enough shape. I, I think I need Vicky to give us a haircut before I can attempt anything that ambitious. Uh, I can give you some tips if you like. <laughs> but yeah, I, I did think that was a, a pretty cheap cosplay. If anyone's ever struggling, like you literally just yeah. need a marker pen and you, you, you light away, basically. They've got those delightful sort of vests with the built-in holsters for their guns, which are uh, quite uh, it's, attractive. It's, it was a strong 60s look, uh, I think. Sturdy footwear, I noticed. I, I was quite fond of it, of the idea of the tumblies, which definitely oh. sounds like a euphemism. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know where... Hello, Doctor, yeah, I, I think I've come down with a serious case of the tumblies. <laughs> They're sort of wobbling along like little Roombas with the little cable ties bobbing, bobbing on their heads. Um, so they, they were quite cunning. I made that curious little farting noise when the aerial comes out the top of their head as well. <laughs> but I, I'm, do you know what? I'm really careful not to rip too much in sort of the visuals and stuff because I think if you're going to mm. watch 60s Doctor Who, you've kind of got to cope with that. Oh, absolutely. And, and in all fairness, if you watch modern Doctor Who and compare it to really kind of expensive American television, it still looks yeah. a bit shit by comparison, doesn't it? So <laughs> yeah, no one no, watches Doctor I've... Who for the, like, the amazing like, CG and the, the fantastic visuals because it, 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 it looks much better now, but if you compare it to its kind of peers, it, it still looks a little bit like sticky back plastic. Um, mm-hmm. And you've got to not mind that. Yeah, I think with the 60s stuff, you can watch it on multiple levels. So the storytelling on a lot of these, and including this one, is, is really good. I, I really enjoy the variety and some of the ideas. They're really kind of pushing the envelope. Some of the effects are, for their time, really, really good. Others, less so. I'm thinking of the bit where Vicky gets trapped in the real spaceship and the Doctor's desperately trying to get her out and he's grabbing hold of the... Um, rather flimsily built gate and he's like oh, I can't I can't get it to move it's just too strong and the whole thing's wobbling around like crazy yeah but I've, <laughs> and that's that's kind of fun I, I've kind of commented Vicky is trapped in a really wobbly climbing frame um likely to be a lawsuit <laughs> um if that was scaffolding going up at my house I'd be very nervous and that's some strong plastic sheeting <laughs> um that aside though I do I do enjoy it I think it's great I think it's a fun story I can kind of cope with that stuff. I, I think there was, there was a bit where kind of Vicky suddenly like just suddenly gathers that the Chumblies like wanted to accompany them, and I'm like, where has she uh-huh. got that from? There's literally nothing mm. in that scene that hints to that. Um, so you do get yeah. them slightly sort of odd mm-hmm. plot holes, I think, where you just think, how how did she know that? I know she needs to say that yeah. to move the story on, but there's literally nothing on that yeah. screen, which is kind mm-hmm. of pointing me to the fact that they want her to accompany them. And I think I struggle with I struggle with the lost and missing stuff. I think it's hard mm-hmm. to review fairly. Yeah. And I know people yeah. have done reconstructions and it's not a slight on people who take the time and trouble and effort to kind of do that. I think it's a reflection on my yeah. slightly crap attention span. <laughs> and I definitely sort of have some ADHD qualities, which is one of the reasons I can't get into big finish either. So if something's audio yeah. only, uh-huh. I, I just don't mm. have the focus. We did some mindfulness training at work and literally all you had to do was eat a sweet and concentrate on eating the sweet. I couldn't do that. So I, I'm clearly someone who needs that visual input to, to kind of get the most out of it. But I don't think it's... It's not a life-changing story, but I don't think it's terrible. No, I don't think it's anywhere near as bad as some people make out. Like, and I think it depends what you like. Like, don't at me, but I think the Aztecs is really overrated. 
Well, yeah, your your teammate on Track This Out, Lindsay, was of the same opinion. Uh, you know, I like Tenth Planet from that era. Mm-hmm. I like the chase. Um, I think War yeah, Machines is really, love the chase. really, really cringy. Mm-hmm. So it's I like Time Meddler. I don't yeah. think it's horrid. I've seen worse. <laughs> <laughs> um, I so I was a, a little bit. I think expecting something slightly different. So I, whether it was from kind of reading about it in DWM or or reading the back of the mm-hmm. Target novel or or whatever, I was expecting there to be this big twist that the kind of attractive blonde women are actually shock horror the baddies and the sort yeah. of jab of the heart Admiral Akbar rills uh, turned out to be the goodies, but. That, mm-hmm. that wasn't what you got. I mean, there was never a... It was obvious from the word go who were the bad guys, who were the good guys. Um, and mm-hmm. I felt it really missed a trick with that. I think it does give an opportunity to the Doctor to spell out his beliefs when he gets to speak to the reals and he explains that he wouldn't judge someone based on what they look like and that kind of thing, which I think is important to hear. And I, I think that's at least something positive to be gained from it. I think at the time as well, like, you know, the, the fugly-looking guys are really the goodies, um, mm-hmm. you know, the the sort of the mean, evil women um, who just kind of, like, use the men in a society um, were much more... were much fresher then. I, I don't think they were as, yeah. as well... I'm not saying they were too completely original, Um but they no. weren't as, as sort of well-worn tropes as they are now. Um, so I think it probably, in, in story terms, was a little bit more surprising at the time. Yeah. That's a good point. But I also thought that the you know, the idea of having um, a race of essentially women uh, as the villains was interesting and, you know, very exciting and different. But... Um, they're, they're basically written like they, they could have just been some men. You know, they were written exactly as as you'd write a team of... If you had a ship full of five people who were all like NIDA from um, Genesis of the Daleks, <laughs> this is how they'd behave. I think there was a nice little bit of feminist dialogue there when uh, they ask Margot, or well, don't you have men on your planet? And she's like, well... We keep a few around, but um, they eat too much food, so we kill the rest. Do you know that doesn't sound terrible to me? I think I might adopt <laughs> that as the um, me election yeah, think, campaign. You fancy, fancy spending a while on Drava? <laughs> I think they've got it basically right, haven't they? And, um, mm-hmm. you know, they're not wrong. But, <laughs> yeah. Um, so what did we think of... So we've, we've touched a little on the, the real spaceship and how that was realised. Mm-hmm. What did we think of the Dravin's shed? <laughs> it reminded me of... I mean, this shows my age a bit, but back in the 80s when I was at secondary school, I don't know if it was just our school, but most schools seemed to have those sort of temporary classrooms and it looked like uh, one of those that somebody had just tried to sort of, you know, zhuzh up a bit by sticking some pointy legs on the outside of but otherwise that was pretty much it it reminded me of that episode of men behaving badly where they build their own sauna um but perhaps it wasn't quite as well done as that (laughs) i think that the dravens were so badass and they they were such mean women they even took the men's sheds away from them (laughs) wow wow yeah that's an amazing insight but you don't even get the shed (laughs) <laughs> what 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 I liked, I think it was in part one when the uh, the Dravin spaceship door opened. One of the Dravin mm-hmm. had the job, presumably a full time. You know, this was her one job of saying yeah. door opening. <laughs> nice, but she didn't yeah. say it ever again. Not in part two. Not in part three. And not in part four. That must have stretched the budget because she had a speaking part there. There's clearly a hundred percent employment on that planet, isn't it? It's very yeah. much jobs, well, jobs for the ladies, obviously. Not. Did you spot that the sound effect they use for the door opening is the same one that's on the um, Dalek control room in the Daleks? I did. I've written down, ooh, Dalek mm. noise. <laughs> and they also use the sound from the control room, the sort of that Dalek pulse noise that they use when they enter the Daleks control room, that sort of heartbeat noise. Oh, I didn't notice that. Yeah. 
It's very quiet mm. in the mix, but you can hear it. Maybe the Dravins bought their craft from the same shipyards as the Daleks. And oh, this was this was the real ship that they used. That oh, part. The, the, so, yeah, right. they so both between, of them, in yeah. fact, yeah, both yeah. of them have either cannibalized Dalek technology in their you know in their backstory, or yeah, they're all, all the aliens are maybe going to the same showroom and buying yeah, some sort of Dalek Arthur Daily type sort of selling dodgy sheds as spaceships. <laughs> This is a carton shot. <laughs> I'm just trying to think who we from Doctor Who would you want to be his kind of second hand spaceship salesman? Glitz, gotta be, gotta be Glitz. Oh, every time, yeah. I was gonna say I've kind of picked on a couple of threads where you think that there's some similarities. Um, so the Dravens get mm-hmm. called back in the Pandorica opens. Um, they do. They yeah. are. Uh, they they get a mention, and I. Th- thought as well i think some of those threads are, and I, I think you can look at quite a few episodes and see that kind of two kind of races who don't like each other or want to kill each other stuck yeah. at sort of opposite sides or on on stuck on a planet or something and um, so i thought the doctor's mm-hmm. daughter with the fish people um yeah. kind of pulls on some of those threads yes very good spot um you've got to see a genesis of the daleks kind of pulls on those threads mm-hmm. as well yeah but so it, it's a bit of a doctor who trope isn't it to have those kind of two two races kind of stuck on the same place they don't like mm-hmm. each other they want to fight each other or one side doesn't want to fight each other or they can't remember why they're fighting each other it does kind of in the way that tenth planet is that sort of base under siege model, I think in some ways this is kind of a, a being used as a bit of a template, whether that's conscious or not. But I think you see that theme; it, it does crop up quite often. Mm. Mm. And in terms of you know having this kind of uh, evil gynocracy, it's obviously a little bit happiness patrol as well. Yeah, yeah, I definitely see that. We've got to talk about the Chumblies. <laughs> we touch on them briefly but yes. i think they're adorable you... i think they're lovely okay so in, in the pantheon of on, Doctor don't Who have monsters, a go at them, please Come you're on. you're putting them at the, the the lovely end of the spectrum i think so yeah that's fine I, like I... a big sort of wobbly plastic blancmange with a weird sort of antenna on top and um they make a cute little noise as they trundle along i mean i don't know how they were realized in the studio because obviously they were too small to have people in them so was it remote control I think they did actually have no i think they had operators inside them well now i think they were little so people I've, I've noticed one of the chumbly operators is is called peppy poopy <laughs> um which i i wrote that down that's not really a, a point to discuss or an interesting <laughs> anything i just wrote that name down because i thought it was funny but um I, yeah i again they were a lot more solid than they could have been. They were a lot more mm. convincing than they could have been, and they were very sweet. Their little noise didn't even begin to grate after, uh, you know, ninety minutes of. Um, actually, it's gone. I can't remember what noise they made now, but I know they made it a hell of a lot. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> I would agree. I think they were a, a cute little bunch of tiny chocolate mousse cartons. I'm curious what they were made of because they kind of it's quite hard to tell in black and white, but they kind of look like yeah. they might be related to Mr. Blobby in terms <laughs> of that that kind of sort of almost like they were kind of wrinkly as if they were almost fabric. Um, it's weird, wasn't it? It's almost like a sort of frosted plastic material. But they did you notice they had lights inside that would flash on and off as well? Yeah, I, I didn't pick up on that straight away, but then I thought like yeah. They probably weren't as, as kind of well lit as they, they could have been because someone had obviously put a lot of time yeah. and effort into that and it wasn't like massively mm. obvious. I reckon if a chumbly shags a terraleptil, you'd end up with Mr. Blobby. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just thinking about it, you know, live. Um, yeah. Wow. That's a really weird relationship. I don't even <laughs> want to start thinking about the mechanics of that. Yeah, actually, it's a good point. Well, you, you don't know how many extendable things that the Chumblies have got. They might have a little genital that comes out with a little noise. Or um... <laughs> Well, Chris Chibnall was open to uh, exploiting the, the back catalogue, so maybe, I mean, they used to have that thing with Hoddy Oaks after dark, didn't they? Maybe they'll do a Doctor Who equivalent and you could pitch your uh, sexy story to them. I, I could, but the think. problem with that idea, Mark, is that it would be tortured. 
<laughs> I feel and, like the tabloid headline takeaway from this chat is like Chris Chibnall exploits chumblies. <laughs> absolutely. Um, and that guy's getting a lot of bad press already. I don't want to add to his, you know, his, no, his stress or his woes. Um, no one, just to be clear, no one is saying that Chris Chibnall has exploited the chumblies. <laughs> For his Absolutely own not. sexual gratifications. No, no one's saying no. that. Just in case his lawyers are listening, no. Statistically, someone's probably a lawyer. Did you feel like the um, the whole thing where Marga explains that they're desperate to get off the planet because in 14 dawns time the planet's going to explode and then the Doctor uses his gadget inside the TARDIS and he determines it's actually going to be two dawns. Did you feel like that ramped up the tension a bit and it kind of helped to drive the story forward a bit or was it, were you um, left a bit lacklustre by it? I thought it was quite exciting but then... A fortnight's I'm quite a pleased. long time isn't it on that kind of serial where it you're is, thinking like well yeah. you've got bloody ages really. I, th- I think they did need to kind <laughs> of read in that time scale um, mm-hmm. You know, it's kind of like where he's he's kind of trapped and, and running out of air. Like if it's like, well, he's he's got enough for a week. Yeah. It kind of loses some dramatic um, <laughs> dramatic tension, there, doesn't it? Like, <laughs> yeah, this this bomb will destroy Gotham City in exactly a year. Oh no! Um, <laughs> I thought I don't know. I because we we weren't really, or or maybe I personally didn't pick up on this, but I don't feel like we were told how long. The, the Rill and the Dravin had actually been trapped on that planet. So they've oh, been... Oh, I think they did say. I think it's some um, 400 dawns. 400 so like days, over a so year. that's three... That's a year. That's like that's over a year. Yeah. That's basically yeah. a year, a month, and a week. Mm. And they've been, what, practising saying, door opening, and, <laughs> you know... <laughs> And doing very little else. I mean, the the real, you know, they've they've not been, they've not even made it down to their real gym. Some of them are looking quite mm. pallid and hefty. I mean, um, at, at the end of the day, it all comes down to Marga, the in inverted commas intelligent drive in deciding that she doesn't want to accept the real's offer of help, and she wants them to die on the planet and take their spaceship. If she'd actually just decided well, actually yes i'll take them up on their offer then i suppose you know it wouldn't have made for a very exciting story or it wouldn't have had a story at all but it it hinges on a, a relatively um ludicrous well, premise unlikely unlikely circumstance yeah and then you have that flashback of her killing one of the uh, driving clones as well and blaming it on the the reels as well i just feel like if you've been trapped there for over a year you'd be kind of bored because it's it's quite a dull planet the doctor sort of walks around and says oh it reminds him of the planet xerox or a, a photocopy of that at least that was, um, that was the one from the space museum wasn't it oh right Zero, yeah. yeah um you know there's nothing to do there they're not going anywhere you'd think you'd you know swallow your pride and just say all right don't tell anyone but yeah give us a lift out of here and <laughs> yeah. you know if you wouldn't have done that on day t minus 400 You'd certainly do it when you only had two dawns left. And why are they talking about dawns in this kind of middle age kind of way when they're international space travellers who should be marking time in, you know, rels or spans or something technical? <laughs> if, if it's not your planet, like a day might be look very, very different to a day at home. Yeah. So you've got to kind of mark time somehow, haven't you? I mean, a day where yeah. you come from could be 12 hours and it could be like 56 hours where you've landed. So I, I, I'm, I'm OK with that. I'm going to defend uh, that. That is actually a really good point, And now I feel faintly foolish. I say faintly. Well, that's I... why we have a grown up in the room with us just to, you know, point out. <laughs> that doesn't out get said about me obvious. very often, so I will take that. <laughs> So um, what did we make of the kind of sexual politics behind the fact that the Dravins only eat leaves? I don't think I picked up on that. <laughs> oh, I think that was in, was it episode three or four? They're just sitting there and they've got a, yeah. I think they, sh- they, they share them with Stephen and he's got like three leaves to mm. eat, which is clearly saying that, yeah. you know, girls oh, eat Oh, and salad. Marga gets different food, doesn't she? she well, she probably gets like a Big Mac and fries with a... She's got a pepper army. A pepper army. <laughs> That would yeah. have to be quite a long pepper army to last her for 400 <laughs> dawns. Um, 
Um, no, I reckon I reckon she's got fast food in there or some kind of device that can just generate whatever she pot feels noodle. like. Or, or pot noodle. If yeah. she was from Sunderland, she'd have cheesy chips. Oh. And a panda pop. And and blue drink. Yeah, yeah panda pop. <laughs> <laughs> not a Middlesbrough Palmo then. Oh no, she's not good. She's not classy enough for that. Oh no. The marker pen makeup and stuff, no, she's, she's not like. <laughs> no. The actress reminding me quite a lot of Jennifer Saunders. Interesting. I she really reminded me of the thin man from Boy from Space. I don't know if anybody oh, knows God, what I'm yeah. talking about, but. They had a lot of the same... Andrea's too young, she won't know about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had a lot of the same energy and quite quite similar bone oh, structure. Oh, used to love look and read. Wordy. Andrea, any idea what we're going on about? No, I don't think I can no. place that. Ah, oh, the kids' educational programme. So back in the, the good old days of the 80s, they never really had, like, daytime telly as such. So if you're off sick, you could effectively just watch the syllabus broadcast by the BBC and they had a programme called Look and Read. Well, I remember that. Yeah, and he had Wordy that would float around. He had like a googly eyes and a pair of arms and he'd just sort of float around using CSO. And they'd have a featured story. So you had um, Dark Towers, which had um, Gary, Russell. Gary Russell in it as an actor. Yeah, that was my favourite. And then you had The Boy from Space, which had these really weirdly bewigged aliens chasing after this kid. God, I've just gone back to a time where you had to go into a special room and sit on the carpet and the teacher oh, would yeah, read all right. the telly yes. and it would have doors. Like, God, yeah. I've, I've yes. gone back to another yes. time there. And, and whichever, <laughs> whichever teacher it was, normally in my case Mrs Harker or Mrs Bather, they'd have no sodding mm. idea how to operate a television. So you'd no. be sat there screaming at them to press the on switch or, you know, <laughs> yeah. blow on the valves or something. And they're just... Of course, oh. he didn't have scart leads back then, so you'd have to tune in the uh, the video recorder to a specific channel and they'd never know what channel to select to have the video on. Oh, you know. it, was, it was interminable. What a nightmare. Wasn't it? I think we missed mm. the start of... Uh, oh, I, I, this isn't the place for, for free therapy. But. Just basically for, for our younger <laughs> listeners, when we were at primary school, they had a special room which you went in to watch a television. And it was a really big, really heavy, like tube television. There were oh, no oh, plasma yeah. screens. Um, so there's a, a little bit of historic context for, for the, the youngsters who may be listening. This is pre eye player. <laughs> so another question I had, obviously... Um, I say obviously, it might not be ob- it might just be my opinion, but I think Vicky had another really marvellous story. And as we touched on at the start, her um, relationship with Stephen is straight away characterised by this kind of, you know, light, friendly, informal, um, fairly bantery mojo. And I, yeah. this is a genuine question: Do people ship Vicky and Stephen the way that they were so keen to do with Ian and Barbara? I wonder. Because obviously we, we've mentioned in previous episodes about the Twitch watch along, and I wonder whether some of the, uh, the younger viewers getting to see this stuff for the first time would have, because they tend to be, or am I am I jumping to conclusions here thinking it's the younger viewers that tend to be the shippers? Andrea, are you a shipper? Well, I'm trying to decide if Stephen's actually hot or he's just got like immense hair, um, and I'm on the <laughs> like a lion man. Yeah. Uh, and I think, especially as I've... I mean, on the Isaac scale, where does he stand? Is he, you know? He, he's like he, he's not even hitting his shoelaces, to be quite frank. Oh. But like that's a right. that, that's a, a special love that has been with me since I was fifteen. <laughs> so we'll, we'll not delve too deeply into that. I don't think. Oh, please tell. Um, Event Horizon was a very confusing experience for me. Oh, cool, um, yeah, just a bit. I, I don't know. Vicky was one of those companions where, like, I never disliked Vicky, but I never, you know, if someone says, which companions do you really like? I never tended to think of her. I think she's a bit unfortunate in that a lot of her stories are missing, so she d- perhaps doesn't get quite the same amount of coverage as some of the others, which is a shame because I think she's fantastic. I think such a marked improvement over Susan. It's it's like night and day, it really is. And I do, because I always think, when you think of Hartnell's era, it's kind of Ian, Barbara, Susan, isn't it? That kind of get yeah. the headlines. Uh, and I, I don't think that's necessarily fair, because no. I, I think the more I kind of sort of think about it, I think Vicky's probably a much better character. 
Absolutely, yeah. So I, I think me sort of me impressions of Vicky, I think, have, have kind of changed it, and I think I'm much more positive. But I do think, mm. yeah, it's a little bit unfortunate that a lot of stuff's not there because I suspect you would probably have a slightly higher following. I think they're quite sweet together. I think I could like. There must be there must be fan fiction exists. Like if you can imagine it, somebody's written it. Lindsay, get on it. <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay just writes about people with, with like horrible illnesses and she, oh. she's like she's into that medical angst. Oh dear. Oh no, no, I wouldn't have that. No. It's not very uh, Mills and Pinnies. There's a lot of money it? in that genre though. Look at five feet apart, you know. Yeah, Lindsay like Lindsay likes the medical angst angle. Um oh. and I write things which I would I would feel wrong imposing that on Vicky and Stephen. <laughs> we can put some we can put some links in the show notes for anyone who's interested. I think, I think the problem is if you were trying to write some erotica with those two, it would be something like Stephen grabbed Vicky manfully and threw her over the console. Then he turned to camera two and started talking about the Blue Peter Bring and Buy sale for five minutes. <laughs> be, you know, because he's always whilst the doctor stood in the background clutching his lapels. There is a crack fic being written live here. Um, I feel like I should be typing as we're going. Um, do, you, do you know I've never written any Doctor Who fanfic? Oh, and I think it possibly is because I have a sort of reverence for Doctor Who that I don't have for other things. Mm. I don't know. Um, I've read plenty, but I've, I've never ever written Doctor Who fanfic. Just seems oh. wrong. <laughs> I think something that's quite interesting is the fact that the Doctor kind of leaves them to die at the end. Yeah. And I don't find that surprising for that era. Mm. It seems very much in character to me. But I'm just thinking, if a story that came out now had the Doctor leave, how, no matter how bad they were, just leave them to die, I'd yeah. be interested to know what the reaction to that would be. Because I think... Mm. I think them certain sections of fun and like, that's a very undoctor like thing to do and the doctor wouldn't do uh, that and Well if you watch enough, I mean it's there's been so many times where he said, Oh, I'd never do this, I'd never do that and then within a couple of stories he's done it. So, you know, he's that's that's just Doctor Who really. Well, I think this is that early period where the character isn't a hundred percent fully formed and he's on his mm-hmm. way to becoming, you know, who what we know as the doctor. Um but he's still, I think, finding his way kind of morally and ethically. And I, th- I think... Well, if you compare him in story one of season three, which we're doing now, to story one of season one, that is quite a, a seismic shift already. Yeah, I mean, he'd have he'd have quite happily killed Ian Chesterton in that story, and he's not <laughs> alone in that. Um, <laughs> but I think I think oh, just, now well, he's, he's gone, just... just... <laughs> Let it go, Ian. I'm it's sorry, okay. but he was such a tosser. Um We've got Buffon Boy and Vicky now. That's you know that's all we need. Yeah, but I I don't know if anyone's been able to pinpoint because you know the, the, when when the Doctor gives the speech now about I use the name the Doctor because I save people and I I travel mm-hmm. and I care for people and I adopted that name for that reason, um, mm-hmm. which is obviously not true because he's already adopted the name before. Although oh no, retcon now well, we've got yeah, all the pre Hartnell yeah. Doctors, but. Is there a moment that anyone can kind of point to where he starts acting like he's chosen to be that kind of um, self-effacing hero who will save everyone and, and help anyone he can? I mean, it doesn't really... Not until maybe Tom Baker does he start acting in that way. I think it's, it, you can kind of, especially when you go back to this era and you hear people like having complete canon meltdowns. And I'm thinking, I've just watched an episode of Doctor <laughs> Who where pretty much like the Doctor and companions are all referred to as the Earth people. And it's like, well, yes. if you want to start picking at canon, yeah. like, mm-hmm. really? Um, <laughs> and I usually find the biggest sort of, sort of people who are most precious about canon but usually haven't even seen this stuff so mm, yeah it, it's an odd I think you just kind of you just watch it I just watch it and if I enjoy what's on the screen I enjoy what's on the screen and I don't try to get too bogged down in these things because I but I, I definitely think the idea of the doctor kind of just leaving the dravens to die let's like, just like fuck them basically and they're not very nice let's just leave them <laughs> I think that would cause so much flap now, and I don't think anyone would have batted an eyelid at that storyline. 
it was a little bit like that. Do you remember the Matt Smith story, Dinosaurs on a Spaceship? Yeah. And you got the character played by David Bradley. Solomon. Who's an absolute sod. Yeah, Solomon. And he effectively leaves him to die. And there was a bit of a, a backlash about that, but... I think also, yeah. more recently, when Graham was having his heart-to-heart with the Doctor and saying he was yeah. scared that his cancer might come back and the Doctor didn't mm-hmm. say anything or really acknowledge that, I think that caused yeah. quite a flap. But I I don't know... It's it's an interesting question. I don't know if, if the kind of average viewer would yeah. expect anything different. The most, or the most they, recent one, mm. Revolution of the Daleks something that cropped up which I suddenly heard going around which I thought I'd never even crossed my mind watching the program was when spoilers if anyone hasn't seen it yet when she pulls the trick of using that second TARDIS that she picked up at the end of the previous series and f- tricks the Daleks into going into it and then it gets crushed into oblivion there's all these people saying well the TARDIS is a living being that's she's just murdered a TARDIS I'm like I'm not sure I'm really willing to go quite that far with it Really? Or maybe I'm just really heartless. Do you know what? It's a strange thing, though, because, like, how many, like, billions of Daleks have got blown up even over the last sort of 10 years? And, like, nobody ever thinks, like, all them Daleks have been murdered. The Doctor shouldn't have killed the Daleks. But if it's anything else, like, possibly the exception of Cybermen, it's like, oh, the Doctor wouldn't kill them. They would do something else. And it's like, but billions of Daleks have just blown them all up and you didn't care it's a very good point you get that speech at the end of Warriors of the Deep where the Doctor's appalled at the slaughter and oh there should have been another way and he, he doesn't want yeah. to hurt anyone but he's a massive racist when it comes to the Daleks and he'd quite happily wipe them all out in a heartbeat well, at the end of the Ribot operation, he just lobs that uh, grenade over his shoulder and blows up a load of people, doesn't he, sir? So in a, in a sense, like, you can't really blame the drivers for turning up in the Pandora Opens, can you? Because, like, he has kind of, like, it's like, yeah, there's, there is some grudge level yeah. there. they got a beef there, definitely. <laughs> they haven't got beef. Or they've got, a they've got three leaves each. That's all they have to eat. <laughs> Do you know what? I don't, if I just had three leaves to eat, I don't think I would be very nice either. Mm. That's true, I'd be a bit tetchy. You know, if, if you're just picking up three leaves, you're not like, you're not going to be particularly friendly, I don't think. Um, do it at me, vegans. Um, I'm sure you're all <laughs> lovely. <laughs> <laughs> but eat some steak. <laughs> Bob put you up to that. <laughs> Bob puts me up to nothing. So I think we've pretty much summed up our thoughts on that story and I think it's time to give it a score out of 10. And I am going to come to Ian first. What are you going to give this one, Ian? Oh, well, I mean, I, I fundamentally, I think this story is a bit of a missed opportunity. As I said, you know, William M's created this society of women but wrote them exactly like, you know, some fairly lacklustre ciphers of of male characters um the plot doesn't really hang together as we've kind of said and the kind of main plus point the story's got going for it is is that the chumblies are quite cute so overall i'm going to give this one a a five middling and what about you andrea what were you going to give this one I don't think it's awful. I think it's quite hard to judge on what I've got to go from. Uh, I'm going to give it a five and a half because I I, I think potentially if I saw it all as a story, I think it's a kind of middle of the road. It almost feels like a filler kind of story and there are issues with it, but um, there's nothing in there. I think, God, I hate this. I can't live with this. Like This is like really irritating. Um, So it's a middle of the road 5.5. Okay. I think that's a fair score. I really enjoyed this one. I know I can totally take on board what you both said, but I don't know if it's just because I have mainlined a lot of the um, the recons previously and I, I'm quite okay with watching them. I know it can put off a lot of people and that may affect your enjoyment of the story. Um, I really love it. I think the Dravins are, you know, a bit one note, but Marga stands out as a quite a a f- scary adversary. Uh, I think the the design of the Chumblies is incredibly cute. The crapness of the spaceships is not so good. 
I think the rills, uh, for what we do get to see of them, are quite well realised. And I think on a fairly throwaway sci-fi 60s level, it's a lot of fun. And for that reason, I am going to give it a 7.5. So that's what we think about this story. Let's go to some listener feedback. I've got mail. So let's hear what you've got to say. And first off, before we get into our Twitter and Facebook feedback, you'll never guess. (gasps) Yes, we've heard from Ben Schneider again on the old audio feedback. Hey, Ben. So let's hear what he's got to say. Peter Purves, Purvis, Purves, I don't know, likes to go on and on about how Stephen had crappy dialogue in this story because he claims all of his lines were originally intended for Barbara. And then the writer just unceremoniously dumped all of Barbara's dialogue onto Stephen's plate. Here, just say these, blah, blah, blah. Well, I, for one, seriously cannot picture Barbara meeting the uh, Drobbins and then saying a line like, No idea who they are, but, oh, aren't they a lovely surprise? And very nice, too. Yeah, I know. I need to work on my Jackie Hill. Thank you, Ben. So I'm going to kick things off. We have heard from Philip Edney, who is one of the hosts on the Sirens of Audio podcast. Hi, Philip. Philip says... Like many Hartnell stories, this had a poor reputation, but with recent finds and reconstructions, it can be seen to be a solid story with a great concept. Although the acting feels somewhat forced by today's naturalism standards, they are still all strong and believable. Very enjoyable. Thank you, Philip. Next up, we've heard from Anthony Carroll on Twitter, at Carol Anthony. Hi, Anthony. He says... Love the episode we have. Simple idea for a story that seems well told. Uh, Next up, we have Liz79 on Twitter. So that's at Liz79. And Liz says, "Uh, it's my favourite Hartnell. Marga is easily one of the best Doctor Who villains and it's very compelling to watch her slowly go insane, surrounded by people who look human but really aren't. She's alone fighting for her life and her pride with a bunch of drones. The test tube drive-ins are basically talking guinea pigs. It's really sad to watch, actually. The music and the set design is fantastic and so depressing. You can really feel the dying nature of the planet they found themselves on. The rills being noble and unique makes it all the more interesting. I've always thought Galaxy 4 had great world building. With just a few lines, it created a depressing backstory for a few generic space warriors. I've thought for a while that Marga actually is empathetic, but she rejects that empathy for the negative emotion so it can drive her further, like some form of self-harm. She finds something stimulating in betraying her conscience. Wow, thanks for that. That's really good. Next up, we've heard from very Pete Lambert, at prof underscore quite a mess. Great Twitter handle. I am the Stephanie Bidmead Appreciation Society. A speech direct to camera about how much she'll enjoy watching a planet die is properly chilling. I think she counts as our first proper villainess. And she doesn't chew the scenery. She's evil, controlled and sinister. Thank you, Pete. Next up, we have Kevin John Davies, who I think is the Kevin John Davies that made more than 30 years in the TARDIS, I think. Blimey heck. Uh, He's at Kevin John Davies on Twitter. And Kevin says... Galaxy 4 seems quaint now, but in 1965, when I was only four, it was electrifying. I'd been well prepared by a pick in the Radio Times, a robot seemingly injecting the Doctor in the leg. Horror! The real face at the cliffhanger of Episode 2 had me literally scurrying behind Mum's armchair. Thank you, Kevin. That's great. And lastly from me, we have our dear friend Ham-Fisted Batvender, at Batvender. And they say, I've always viewed this fairly positively. Admittedly, a slim plot and some one-dimensional characterisation, but there's something to be said for a simple tale told with a little visual panache. Martinus working wonders with limited resources. That's uh, Derek Martinus, yes. And I adore Le Structure Sonore. So that's the French band that provided the um, stock music. I think they'd reused that from one of the previous stories as well. So thank you, guys. Um, We're going to head over to Ian now. Who have you heard from? So we've heard from Jeff Goddard, who says, 
I've always had a soft spot for this one since I first read the Target novelization when I was about 11. The mini reconstruction on the Aztec special edition DVD gets a regular airing from me just to see that lovely design work. And I agree with Nathan, Vicky is wonderful. We've heard from a friend of this parish, Dwayne Bunny, who presents the Sirens of Audio podcast. He says... I love it. It would be great for this to get the animated treatment so we can enjoy it all as its own release. Lots of animation required for this season, isn't there? I think the Dravins are really robo-ladies. Check out the sound effect on the doors of their spaceship, same as Dalek doors. Just to cut in, you'd expect a kind of sound guy to pick up on that kind of thing. Uh, (laughs) He continues, I also love the music in this one too. Was it the same composer as the Web Planet? Yes, it was. Sounds similar. Mm -hmm. Very cool. We then heard back from Duane, who said, answered my own question by going to TARDIS Wiki, the stock music used for the soundtrack was performed by experimental group called Lay Structure Sonor. They performed their music on glass tubes. Some of the same music was used in the web planet. So, yeah. We've heard from Nathan Bottomley, who, again, friend of the show, brilliant guest on the show, Go back and check his one out. Um, he, he says, I've always secretly loved this story on audio, and so the recovered episode was a lovely surprise. Inventively designed and beautifully directed, and isn't Vicky wonderful? Yes, she is. David Kitchen, another um, g- hallowed hero of our back catalogue, says, and this is controversial, folks, sadly, I think it's one of the few weak Hartnells. I like the attempt at some truly alien designs, but it's all a bit shallow, a bit cheap. And brace yourself, feels a bit too much like a 60s Star Trek episode. Ooh. Harsh criticism indeed. It yeah. is fighting talk. Um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to, I'll forward you his address so you can go and duff him <laughs> up. Uh, John Hood says, quite simply, Chumbly's for the win. Or at least I assume that's what FTW stands for. It could be something unspeakably rude. (laughs) Ben Scott says, It's seemingly a good serial. Would love an animation, but I I bet it's amazing in colour. Nick Smith says, I enjoyed the audio and the novelisation, but with so few visuals to go by, it's hard to judge it properly. Love those chumblies. Yeah, everyone loves the chumblies. uh, Al Fleming on Twitter, Al underscore Fleming underscore 26, says he always rather liked it, so was thrilled when episode 3 showed up. Has it really been almost 10 years? Stephanie Bidmead is brilliant in it, and the Chumblies are rather cool. The Rills are great designs, and it's nice that we can see one in action now. Animation soon, please. Yep. Excellent, thank you. And Andrea, who have you heard from? We've got Dan Talks Doctor Who on Twitter. I enjoyed the audio more than I expected to. I feel it could be a hidden gem if the missing episodes ever showed up. We've got at Jess Jerkovic. This was the first missing story that I got the audio with narration CD. For that reason, it will always have a soft spot. The Doctor and Vicky have strong roles, but Stephen does get sidelined after episode one. Got chills during Magus Soliloquy and then they die and was thrilled that airlock was recovered so I could see that speech. Um, And then we've got Andy Taylor, who's at Bodge 77. Before the episode turned up a few years ago, it was always a pretty dull affair. Sideline and Stephen with Barbara's lines. Maga's lovely soliloquy makes you wonder what other treasures we're missing. As a story, though, it's a bit cliched with the ugly doesn't mean bad trope. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much for giving us your feedback. We really appreciate hearing from you. And if you want to let us know what you think about a forthcoming story, uh, we'll be listing all the various ways you can get in touch over our end credits. So it just leaves us to thank Andrea for coming on and being our guest. Thank you so much, Andrea. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me on. It's been a real pleasure. Would you like to give your show a plug before you go? If anybody wants to get into any more Star Trek related fight and talk, you are more than welcome to, <laughs> to follow us. It's a Trek This Out podcast. Um, it is at 
Trek This Out pod on Twitter, we where we do um, a fairly regular review show. Um, we've reviewed everything that's been airing recently, so from kind of series one of Picard, um, last series of Discovery, um, Lower Decks. Um, we, we go back into the archives a little bit as well. So if, if anyone wants to to argue about the original series, I am the uh, the defender of such things on that show. So. Um, <laughs> So you can certainly join in with some of the others at Byron, your critique of that. So so please give us a listen um, if Star Trek is also up your alley. Excellent. Yes, you'll also find Bob and Lindsay, who've been on our show before, on Trek This Out. So uh, if you enjoyed hearing them and Andrea, then you definitely need to have a listen. I believe um, long-time listener of Trek This Out, Deb, um, is joining you as well next time. That's right, yes, you'll be joining us for our next story, in fact, which will be Mission to the Unknown. So until next time, thank you again for listening. I've been Mark. I've been Ian. And I've been Andrea. If you'd like to get in touch, you can email us at mailbagofrassalon at gmail.com. We're also on Twitter at Time and Space Pod, And you can also find us on Facebook. If you want to leave some audio feedback, There is a link in the show notes. You can use your phone or your computer and leave up to 60 seconds of feedback. Or if you're listening via the Anchor website, you can click on the message button and leave your audio. We'd love to hear from you. And thank you to Momo Tempo for providing our theme music.